In the previous video, I presented ChatGPT as a solution for optic relational management on steroids. I still hold to that view. However, I've modified my viewpoint on that such that, yes, ChatGPT is useful in presenting and proposing code structures and, and code statements that you can incorporate into a project. On the other hand, as I went into great detail in the previous vi videos, ChatGPT does have a, a penchant for error and ChatGPT can oftentimes produce correct software code that is nonetheless invalid in terms of how much it addresses the situation or how complete that code is. So another way of saying that is ChatGPT can generate code that will compile, that you can run, and all will look well, but the code is missing more elements that would make it something that you would, could rely on in a production scenario. So taking that into account, and seeing what I needed to do to advance this software project that I'm working on, I looked at the codes that was generated in my collaboration with the ChatGPT large language model and decided that while it was a good start and it was helpful in moving the project forward in terms of jogging my memory, it had been a good while since I had written code that used ADO.net, right? And so what ChatGPT output through my dialogue with ChatGPT definitely got me thinking about that type of code once again, after having spent over 20 years with ADO.net, right? And ADO in various forms, even prior to that, right? I was like, okay, what would be the best way to go about that? And so ChatGPT gave a good suggestion, but as I go through and I scan through some of the data access code, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, you know, there are some refinements that can be made. And what you are looking at on the screen is the next several steps beyond what ChatGPT had proposed to me. So at this point, right and this this um, particular session was on uh, july 10th 2023 around 2 p.m right and so i had already advanced beyond uh, what chat gpt had proposed and i'm st i'm looking at this code and i'm like you know i really need to make this process not only more reusable right but I need to make it more generic. I need to make this process more generic for a couple of reasons. Number one, I love the flexibility that one gains with generic coding styles, right? Where you have basically code that essentially can look like a template and it can fit a variety of situations. So I love that type of code. I didn't always, if you go back maybe uh, I guess 10 years ago, I was against generic um, programming patterns, right? Um, but I had changed since then. What's that guy's name? Uh, I think his name is Alex Alexander Stepanov. Um, he helped um, author the, the standard template library in C++. And he had a very good book. I believe the title was From Mathematics to Generic Programming. I wrote an extensive blog post on it at gauchetalkstechnology.wordpress.com. But after going through his point of view and the, the views of um, Bajarn Straustrup, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, the creator of C++, right? They make a very solid case for generic programming. And so anyway, that's now a part of my normal style in the way that I approach things, the way I look at things, 
in many areas of the software code. So I'm sitting here, I'm looking at uh, these statements and it's just screaming out to me, you know, not literally, but it's kind of just sticking out to me saying, you know, this can be put in a much better way. And the thing is, is that I said, okay, let, let's, let's get to it then. But what you're going to see in the next couple of videos, starting from this one, is very simply a coding style that I've been using for, I'm going to say, close to 10 years, almost 10 years. So I've, I've, been in, I've been affiliated with software development in various forms since the early 1990s, right? And so, but professionally, in a professional sphere, you could say basically 20 to 25 years. And over that time frame, my coding styles and what I've learned in terms of programming methodology has greatly shifted and changed over that time. And so this is one of those moments where it's like, okay, I tried a certain approach, a certain coding style approach when I was building software in C++. If you look at my C++ videos, the coding styles that I use there and the, the entire approach that I use there is completely different than what you see in this particular video. What you see in this video is more reminiscent of how I write code in a professional atmosphere or a profession, what we call a professional situation. And so in that situation, extensive reusability and the ability to apply codes and modules and objects in a variety of situations speeds you up, saves you a lot of time, and when you can get the code solid in a particular component, basically a component-based architecture, then you end up with a much more stable solution overall. So, so in those professional environments, I use Microsoft.net a lot and C Sharp. I don't use C++ or Linux or anything in those environments. And so what you're seeing here is quintessentially the way I code typically code in a uh, business oriented scenario and situation. And I'm doing that here because the tool set is basically set up for that. So .NET and C Sharp are set up for that sort of thing. And here I go here creating a generic uh, function for uh, counting the rows in a database, right? Uh, from, the view, from the vantage point of the C Sharp application, right? There's actually multiple layers to this, but from the standpoint of the software application, I'm using a concept that I hope to apply in a more consistent way so that when the code is read and when the code is executing, that consistency brings back a, a, a huge amount of value in terms of how everything processes and how everything runs. So. What I wanted to do was take that concept of um, getting back a collection of values from SQLite and determining if there are rows or not, right? Basically, are there rows or aren't there, right? And basically, that's an existence test. Does, is there any data available for a given feed? So that's a very, very important concept to have, and it's a very important thing to know in terms of how the code is going to branch off, right? And so basically, the way it branches off here is if there are rows, then I need to modify, I need to go into a modif modification uh, state. If there are no rows, if zero rows exist, then I need to go into an insert or additive state. So that's basically what I do here. And in the next video, I'm going to expand on this further. And hopefully, by the time we get to part 11, many of these changes will become clear in terms of their value and contribution to the solution.